Dr. Michael Eads from Little Rock, Arkansas, is another of the pioneers of the low carbohydrate movement in North America. And when he changed his diet to become more low carbohydrate diet, he wrote this book, Protein Power. And this is written in the 1990s, before there was this great movement towards accepting the low carbohydrate diet. So he's been there for a long time. And in his lecture, he's gonna talk about the cognitive dissonance that there is, and the fact that we can't see what is obvious and we completely ignore all the evidence, much of which is presented in his book, and we ignore it as if it doesn't exist. And he will show us some of that evidence and ask the question, can we continue to ignore the evidence and see everyone become sicker and sicker year by year? Uh, first, I'd like to thank Professor Noakes and Karin for setting this whole thing up. It's fabulous. I know what a... Uh, what a huge undertaking it is to do something like this on this scale, and uh, I know the work involved, so I really appreciate it, as I'm sure do all the other speakers. <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you today about uh, sort of my history in, uh, in the low-carb diet and how I came to it and uh, some of the, the roadblocks I ran into and the problems that I had. And let me see. There we go. Now, today, we have a lot of studies, and I'm gonna show you uh, this. Where do you point this thing to make it work? Is there, is there any particular direction? Is that the laser thing? Hmm? Is that the laser thing? Yeah, no, not the laser, just, just okay. Now, this is, a, this is an example of really bad PowerPoint, and I've thrown this up here so that you'll see that the whole rest of it will be a lot better. But the, the, uh, this is 25 randomized control trials that all show the low-carb diet is superior to the low-fat diet. And we have those studies. Now, actually, we have more than this. This is just a compilation done by a guy named Sam Feltman, who's in uh, the UK. And you can get this, uh, this spreadsheet on his, on his blog at Smash the Fat. But when I got started on this, there really weren't any studies to speak of. And when I discovered what a powerful therapeutic tool the low-carb diet was, and I tried to explain that to people, I was always asked, well, where are the studies? And it's difficult to explain to people the difference between academicians and clinicians, and that clinicians just don't go out and do studies. Um, and academicians do. You know, uh, clinicians don't have to deal with IRBs and all the rest of the stuff. But anyway, if you're a clinician, it's really difficult to do a study. But people were always asking, where's the data? Where's the data? Where are all the studies? If this is as great as you're telling me it is, where is the data that proves it? Well, now we've got the data, but people are still asking that question. They're not satisfied with the data. But at any rate, these are 25 uh, studies that Sam has compiled. As you can see, all of them, in all of them, the low-carb diet beats the low-fat diet. Now, this is just the tip of the iceberg of this spreadsheet that he has. He's got cardiovascular risk factors thrown in here. He's got a wealth of information. So if you go to this, uh, this URL, you can pull this entire spreadsheet down and look at it at your leisure, and you can really see the benefits of the low-carb diet. Now, it's not that he's just cherry-picked these studies. These are the studies that are out there looking at a low-carb diet. And most of these studies were designed, if you can believe this, to make the low-carb diet fail. And, and despite that, it's turned out to be, they've uh, turned out to be positive results. Now, why is the low-carb diet made to fail? Well, in most of these studies, the low-carb diet was unrestricted with food. They said, look, just restrict your carbohydrates to 60 grams, 30 grams, 80 grams, whatever it was in the study, uh, and just restrict that, and, <coughs> excuse me, and eat all you want. And in the other study, the control arm or the low fat arm, those are virtually always restricted. They're low in fat, but they're usually restricted in calories as well. So this is a setup for the low carb diet to lose, to fail, and it ends up being triumphant in virtually every case. Now, are there any studies out there where the low fat diet has triumphed? Well, uh, yep. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is a summary of, of, oh, I can see this down here. Okay. This is a summary of what you, <laughs> this is a summary of what, uh, 
what you see in, in these 25 studies, that the low-carb dieters lose 65% more weight. 17 of the 25 trials show statistically significant weight loss on the low-carb diet. Now, that means that eight didn't. They did show weight loss. It just wasn't statistically significant. And as this talk goes on, I'm going to tell you why that's the case many times, why they really do lose more weight, but it doesn't show up as such on studies. The low-carb <coughs> low subjects were three and a half times better in terms of the health outcomes they experienced, and the adherence level was about the same in both. And you can see what the average macronutrient uh, composition of these diets was. Now, I ask you if there were studies that showed the low-fat diet was better. Well, there actually are a couple, but they really had to slice them and dice them to get them that way. And when you really look at them, they're really not all that much better, if at all. They're about equal. But on the 25 you saw, the low-carb diet beat the low-fat diet in every case, even though it didn't reach statistical significance, it still beat the low-fat diet. In this case, they were about even, but what they did in these two studies is they pre-selected subjects who were insulin sensitive. Now, the vast majority of people that are obese are insulin resistant and have one or more components of the metabolic syndrome. So they took uh, uh, subjects in these studies that were not uh, insulin resistant, who were insulin sensitive. And when they studied those on low carb or low fat diets, it turns out that the low fat diet does just as well as the, as the low carb diet does. Now in the patients in these groups that were not insulin sensitive, they were insulin resistant, however, they, the insulin resistant ones lost much more weight on the low carb diet. So these are the two studies that, that sort of, uh, uh, that you can point to or that the low-fat people can point to and say, okay, well, you know, the low-fat diet is better in some circumstances than it is if you're, in, it's not better, but it's equal if you're insulin sensitive. Now, this is a, a meta-analysis, which I'm usually not fond of these, but this shows some, uh, a, about a, a typical picture of what you see when you compare low-fat and low-carb diets. Now, the, the requirements to get in this meta-analysis were that the low-carb arm of the diet had to be uh, 60 grams or less of carbohydrate and unrestricted food consumption. The low fat arm was less than 30% of fat or less and restricted in calories if your BMI was over uh, under 20, I mean over 25 and, and virtually everybody's BMI was over 25. So it's a, a low fat restricted diet versus a low carb unrestricted diet. And as you can see, the low carb diet pretty much wins all the way through after six months. Then the Stanzinger study uh, has got it favoring the low fat diet a little bit. And without going into all the details, I don't really believe that. And I'm gonna talk to you a little bit later why this Danzinger study and a lot of other studies aren't really as good as, as they look like they are at first blush. Now, this is after 12 months. You can see the low carb diet still uh, is doing better, and the low-fat diet has moved a little bit more into positive territory. But still, there's a reason for that that we'll talk to, or that we'll talk about in a little bit. But I want you to see what the data looks like today, because it wasn't like that when I started. And today, uh, if I were a doctor, which I am, or a dietitian or a nutritionist, and I was putting my patients on a diet to lose weight, okay, and I was practicing evidence-based medicine, I would look at this chart and say, we've got 25 randomized controlled trials showing the superiority of the low carb diet and two, and that's being generous, showing the superiority or at least the, the equalness, if that's a word, of the low fat diet. And it, to me, it's a real no brainer which way I would go. But a lot of people still don't feel that way. Even when presented with massive amounts of data, they just can't get their brains around it. And I'm going to talk to you <clears throat> near the end of this talk about why that is, because it's kind of interesting. Okay, when I got started in this, it was back in 1985, and I've got proof, like the people that stand with the USA Today in front of them when they're starting a weight loss program. I started back then, and this is what was going on back then. In 1978, high fructose corn syrup entered the market. The obesity in the U.S. had been stable at 12 to 14 percent since 1960. And that's despite the fact in 1953 there was one McDonald's. And by, 19, uh, by 1980, there were about 8,000. And still, 
the rates of obesity had been fairly stable. This is since 1960, but they'd been stable until about 1980. Uh, the USDA released its first ever low-fat dietary guidelines in 1980. And a lot of people say, who cares? I mean, dietary guidelines, you don't have to pay attention to them. Well, that's not really true. And I debated one time a, a really famous television host, the people that are American will know who it is, Bill O'Reilly, about this thing. And he said, in his whiny voice, eh, not my, what difference does it make? Nobody, you know, follows the dietary guidelines. Anyway, I don't even know what they are, and I eat what I want. Well, the problem is, the way that the law is written, the government, any uh, any people that the government feeds, and when I debated O'Reilly, it was about eight or nine or ten years ago, there were 53 million people that the U.S. government fed every day. 53 million people. And they have to adhere to the guidelines. That's the way the law is written. So that's people in prison, that's people on commodity programs, that's people with school lunches. Uh, that's anybody that the government feeds according to the nutritional guidelines. They have to comply with those guidelines. So it's a lot of people. 1982, the Mr. Fit study came out and it bombed. 1984, the NIH-sponsored lipid research clinic study also bombed. You wouldn't think that with the press coverage it got, but it ended up in retrospect really bombing, and, and they as much admitted it, as admitted it. Uh, Anthony Gatto, president of the HA, said, we will conquer atherosclerosis by the year 2000. 1986, the NIH and the, a, uh, the American Art Association established the National Cholesterol Education Program. And you can see where all this is going. This cholesterol, anti-cholesterol mania was starting to develop. Uh, 1986, the FDA says no conclusive evidence sugar causes chronic disease. 1987, Mevacor, the first statin, was approved by the FDA in record time because we've got to get rid of this cholesterol. And in 1988, the Surgeon General's report gave the highest priority of anything to reducing fat intake. And right in the middle of this, right in the middle of this in 1985, is when I decided to start treating patients with a low carbohydrate diet. <laughs> and it was, it was kind of an interesting genesis. Uh, at the time, there was a program called OptiFast that was a hospital-based weight loss program. It was a defined formula diet, and uh, it was like bariatric surgery. I mean, it was like, you know, weight loss surgery. You had to go to the hospital to get OptiFast. The doctors there were hospital-based that did it. You had to show up to the hospital for your, uh, um, your, physical, exa <coughs> excuse me, your physical exam and your weekly follow-ups. You had to do all that. And it was, um, you know, it was in the minds of people, serious stuff. And it was a, uh, it was kind of a, a, a follow-up on the old Cambridge diet from 1970 that, uh, that Alan Howard invented back then in Cambridge. And it was this, you know, protein supplemented modified fast. Now, when I was looking this up to get my dates right, I found this great little thing, especially for me because I hated linear algebra when I was in engineering school. And I, I whizzed through calculus, but linear algebra really did me in. But anyway, it says linear algebra can be applied to the Cambridge diet to estimate the amount of each particular food group and individual needs to fulfill the diet restrictions. Using linear, uh, linear algebra methods, the amount of each nutrient required by the Cambridge diet can be written as a scalar multiple of a vector which produces a linear equation. A matrix can be formed using these linear equations and desired serving suggestion for each food group can be calculated by augmenting these matrices with the daily requirements. Now, not only did whoever write this love the passive voice, it is, you know, <laughs> it, it doesn't look like a, uh, a real recipe for a popular diet book. But anyway, that was the Cambridge diet. And the OptiFast diet, as I say, was a, a, a defined formula diet, a protein diet, and it, had, uh, it was hospital-based. Okay, now at the time, I was in a busy family practice, and I had, for the first time in my life, actually gained weight. And I'd been thin all my life, and the next thing you know, I was sporting about an extra 25 or 30 pounds, which was really unusual for me. I mean, and it didn't, it's not like Gary Taubes was talking about where it just gradually came on over two decades. This came on over what seemed like about two years. It just, bam, happened. And 
anyway, I was kind of interested in the OptiFast diet, and I started reading a little bit about nutrition uh, because I, too, had a three-hour class in medical school on nutrition. So I read a little bit about the OptiFast program, and I thought I wanted to do it, but I knew the guy that did it in the hospital, and I didn't particularly like him, and I didn't want to go over there and throw myself on his mercy. And, you know, insurance didn't pay for it. It was an expensive thing to do. So, uh, you know, I just sort of thought about it. And then this Medifast came on the scene. Now, Medifast was essentially the same thing. It was uh, a protein-sparing modified fast that you used little packets of protein and you took them five times a day and you lost weight and you did great. And, but the difference was that Medifast, doctors and clinics could do it. You didn't have to be affiliated with a hospital. So I read about this somewhere, so I called up the company that makes it, which was Jason, uh, Jason Nutraceuticals or Jason Nutrition. Anyway, uh, they were in Maryland, and I called them up and I said, hey, I'm a doctor and I've got a, a busy practice in Little Rock, Arkansas. <clears throat> I've got a lot of overweight patients. I myself have gained a, a few pounds and I'd really like to uh, start using your program in my clinic and helping patients lose weight. Uh, how can I get started? And they said, do you have a credit card? <laughs> and I said, sure. And so the next thing I knew, I was a, uh, a Medifast doctor. And I started uh, putting people on the Medifast diet. And I soon, and it came, you know, when I got my whole packet, there was enough for me and, I don't know, three or four patients. And so I started uh, myself on it. And I started reading all the manuals, which is unlike me to read an instructional manual and in something I buy. But I did read the manual on this. And when I read the manual on this, it, it made it pretty clear. And I have misplaced these manuals. I'd really love to go back and find them now because it made it pretty clear to me at the time that the engine behind the weight loss was not only the caloric restriction because it was about 800 calories a day, but was the carb restriction because they kept talking about uh, measuring ketones in people and the benefits of being in, in dietary ketosis and how people wouldn't be hungry and you wouldn't have complaints from your patients and you needed to check them and make sure they were in ketosis and blah, 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 blah. So I, I got the gist pretty quickly that the engine behind the whole thing was the carbohydrate restriction. And so I started putting patients on the program and they did well and I did well, but I started modifying it and adding more whole foods. And I took them off one of their shakes and I put them on a full uh, food meal at night. But nonetheless, I, I proceeded with this and I uh, uh, think I had to take a little test and send it in, but whatever I did, I ended up, and, and here's my proof, I ended up getting this, uh, this diploma suitable for framing from the Medifast program <laughs> in December of 1985 that said that I was uh, qualified, I'd, I'd fulfilled all the prerequisites to be a certified Medifast uh, um, physician. Now, I'm gonna leave this slide up for a, a few minutes because I wanna talk about some other stuff because I'll switch off of this slide when I get to the point in the study where the guy that, uh, ah, what am I, back. When I get to the part in the study where the guy that signed my diploma that founded the Medifast program was screaming at me on the phone and telling me that I was going to be responsible for the deaths of hundreds of people. Uh, but anyway, I, I went on with this program and I started modifying it and tweaking it. And the one thing I noticed about the Medifast program and the OptiFast program was that the engine that made them work was the carb restriction and the caloric restriction that, that sped it up. But the carb restriction mainly was what allowed people to stay on it and that, that people will lose weight very successfully with the program. And then what would happen is when it came time to go on maintenance, they stuck them on a high carb diet, which made absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. I thought, okay, if the low carb diet is doing all the work here, why are we putting them on a low fat maintenance diet? So I put all my patients on a low carb maintenance diet and they did, you know, they did pretty well. And as I say, I integrated low carb meals in with the shake so that they didn't have a, a full shake diet and they seemed to lose weight just as well and were a whole lot happier not having to do the, to do the shakes. And then I got this bright idea because a patient said to me, you ought to write a book about this. Well, I'd always kind of wanted to write a book. So I thought, you know, that's not a bad idea. But I had no earthly idea how to go about writing a book. I don't mean the writing part of it, but how to get one published and sold. And so I went out, as is my want, and I bought a book on how to get a book published. 
And it said, well, what you got to do is you got to, if it's a nonfiction book, you got to write a book proposal first. And then I learned that a book proposal was this 50 page document that had an introduction and a, a bit about whoever the author was. It had comparisons between the book you were writing and other books that were out there. And it had, uh, you had to have a, a table of contents done. You had to have many pages with chapter summary, you know, a, a chapter summary of each chapter because the publishing company wanted to make sure you'd thought this thing through and that you really did have, have a book and it wasn't just a magazine article. And so I looked at that thing and I said, oh, I gotta write a 50 page book proposal. And, and, and it said, then once you've got your book proposal written, you need to write query letters to the, um, to the publishers, to the publishing company and ask them if they want to see your proposal. That's the secret. You don't just send them this stuff, a manuscript, because it goes in a slush pile. You send them a query letter and then some real person will get back to you. Well, this was, you know, before the days of the internet, obviously. And, and so I went out and I bought this, this big literary guide that tells you all the publishers and what kind of books that they publish. And it also lists all the, the editors. And so I figured I'm gonna have a better chance if I send this to a specific editor than if I just send it to the publishing company, even the query letter. So I wrote my query letter to a, uh, the specific editors of about 10 or 12 book publishing companies. And, and the book that I'd read telling me how to do this said, it's gonna take forever. Publishing moves at a snail's pace. So send your stuff off and wait and see what happens, but it's gonna be a while. Well, this was all snail mail. And within a week, I had three responses back from people, all of them saying, we'd like to see your book proposal, send it along. I thought, oh my God, now I've got to write a book proposal and a 50 pager at that. And, and it was compounded by the problem that I don't type. And so I uh, recruited my lovely wife and I kind of hand wrote this thing and I dictated it. And over a, an intense weekend, we got this thing put together and I sent it out. And meanwhile, the next week, more queries were coming back with people saying that they wanted to see the proposal too. So I sent this proposal off and then I started getting rejection letters, which was really brutal. Uh, after they had seen their proposal, they said, it's not right for us now. That's what publishers always say, you know, it's just not right for us right now. It's not right for our list. And then I get a call from an editor at Warner Books and she says, we're really fired up about your proposal and we would love to talk to you about it. But you know, books are not, and this is, the awful truth about publishing, but it is true. Books are not sold based on the quality of the book. They're sold on the promotability of the author. And they said, we want to see if you're promotable. And I thought, oh my God, okay. And they said, we want you to come to New York and meet with us. So off I go to New York and I meet with them and I end up getting a book contract and a, uh, uh, an agent out of the whole deal. So now I've got an agent and I've got an editor and I've got a book contract and I don't know how to type. And so, uh, <laughs> so I started basically teaching myself to type so I could get this thing written. And somewhere along the way in this process, the guy here, Vitaly, gets wind of the fact that I'm doing a book on protein sparing modified fasting. And so he, writes me and says, hey, I hear you're doing a book on the PSMF and I'd, uh, you know, I'd like to be a part of it and I'm around for any help. If you need any help, ever need any help, any advice, anything like that, I'm always available and I'll, uh, uh, I would love to write the forward. I thought, okay, that sounds great. And so I proceeded on with the writing. He ended up uh, actually coming to Little Rock at one point and taking my wife and me to dinner. It's a lovely dinner. He was a nice guy, nice wife. And he kind of nibbled around the edges of what the book was about. And I'm thinking, you know, this guy makes his living selling this stuff. And I'm telling people how to make it in this book. Now, you got to remember that back then, and this is hard to believe, but back in the mid 80s, mid to late 80s, there weren't this plethora of protein powder, uh, powders that there are today. You know, you got protein powders all over the place that you can go get. There were just a handful back then and they were awful. They were like powdered egg white and bodybuilders used them and they mixed them with applesauce or put them in with ice cream and a banana in a, in a blender. And they were really wretched. So you had to, you know, you had to doctor those things up to make them palatable. 
And so anyway, we, my wife and I sat down and fiddled with these things and got really pretty close to what the Medifast tasted like. And I thought, you know, when this guy finds out what I'm doing in this book, he's going to go ballistic. And the reason that I did it was, A, I kind of wanted to write a book, but B, I'd had such great success with patients and nobody had a problem. And when you add the extra meal in, you get them up to about 12, 1300 calories, and it's a low, uh, a low carb diet. And I didn't have any problems with people. Their lab work got better. Uh, you know, it was a good thing. It wasn't that I had this huge percentage of patients that were, that were having serious problems with it. Everybody did great. And I thought, people can do this at home. They don't need to spend the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars to go to a doctor's office. A lot of people need this. They can't afford to do it. A lot of people will do it if they can afford it, even if there's a book out there. So it's going to be a win-win all the way around. So anyway, I get the manuscript of the book finished, and I take it to the, um, uh, to the overnight. Now you do all this stuff by email, but I took it to the overnight, and I sent it off, and I sent him a copy. And about three days later, wow, I get this phone call, and this guy is hot. And... <laughs> He tells me that I'm going to kill all these people. He brings up the specter of this last chance diet. I don't know if any of you have known anything about this, but this was a diet book written back in the mid, kind of early mid-70s. And it was by a guy named Dr. Robert Lynn. And it, it, so it didn't sell, but this stuff called ProLynn that he had developed was available. I mean, this was a hugely successful diet book. And this ProLin was this cherry-flavored, hydrolyzed collagen stuff that you buy, that you would buy at drugstores, and you would take it by the tablespoon, a couple of tablespoons at a time, two or three times a day, and that's all you ate. And of course, you were in heavy ketosis, and and you probably weren't very hungry, but it was essentially a fasting program, not a modified fast. I mean, it was, I guess, mildly modified, but it was, um, it was a, um, uh, I mean, basically, people were just fasting. And what ended up happen, happening with this is a number of people died on it. And you can see the, the papers that were out there, and it created a real furor, which is why there weren't a lot of protein powders and why back then all the protein powders had little disclaimers on them like cigarette packages do today. They had these little disclaimers that said not to be used for weight loss because of what happened with this last chance diet. And so this guy from Medifest is saying, you're going to be last chance diet number two. And all these people are going to die. And I said, it's completely different. These people are getting 12, 1,300 calories a day, taking care of, by this time, several thousand patients on it. It's not going to be a problem. And he was screaming at me on the phone. And I finally said, well, look, do you want to write the forward or not? Absolutely not. I said, okay, fine. And he said, uh, you need to, to stop publication of this book. And I said, I have, I'm not going to stop publication. I can't do it. The publisher's got it. They're the ones that are going to have to stop it. So he writes this scathing letter to the publisher telling them that they're going to be responsible for the deaths of thousands. Not only that, he recruits this academic surgeon at Harvard named George Blackburn, who writes a letter to the publisher. And that really got their attention coming from a, a Harvard prof that all these people were going to die on this diet. So then what ended up happening was, back to OptiFast here for a minute, Oprah Winfrey, whom everybody in America knows, if you guys from South Africa may not know who she is, but she's a highly recognized, <laughs> highly recognized television personality in the U.S. Do you get, do you get the, her show over here? Okay, so everybody knows who Oprah Winfrey is. But she, is, she was easily the most recognized personality on TV. And she had been undergoing a weight loss program herself. <laughs> and, but she was keeping it under wraps. And she kind of dressed herself in a way that you, you could tell she was losing weight, but she didn't really know how much weight she lost. And so on the very day, I mean the very day that I put my manuscript in the overnight to the publisher, I come home. Everybody in the clinics gaggled around Oprah. They're saying, you're not going to believe this. And Oprah has come out, announced that she had done the OptiFast diet. And she was pulling around her little red wagon with <laughs> teeth. I keep pushing the wrong button. Back. <laughs> there. Her little red wagon 
with the 67 or 69 pounds, I can't remember what it was, of, of fat, not that she had lost, but representing the fat that she had lost uh, on the OptiFast diet. Well, you can imagine the, the furor this caused. And my publisher, Warner Books, is setting with a manuscript telling people how to do this at home. And so, on the one hand, they're getting these letters from Blackburn and from Vitaly telling them that people are going to die and they're making me write rebuttals to them. And on the other hand, Oprah Winfrey's come out saying she's gone on a fasting program and they've got a manuscript for it. So what do we do? They published. And they, <laughs> and they published quickly. And any of you that have ever written a book will not believe this, but I sent this manuscript off on the 14th of November and books were in the store before Christmas. Okay, that's how quickly they came out with this. And here was the book, and they, you know, they brought me to New York to, to do all the copy editing and everything. The copy editor was in the other room, and we were going back and forth getting all this done. They sent me to a photographer who took 8,000 pictures. I guess they wanted a Mona Lisa smile. I don't know. But that's, uh, that, that's what <laughs> they finally ended up with, with this book. And so it came out. And just in case you're wondering, this is how this stuff was made. It's, uh, it was dry, uh, you know, it was, it was dry milk, basically, uh, milk and egg protein. There were, as I say, there were only three or four different brands of protein out there, milk and egg protein, uh, no salt, which is a potassium substitute for salt, potassium chloride, and believe it or not, a little bit of fructose. <laughs> and not very much, just uh, not even a teaspoon, just a few grams of fructose in each dose. And I did that because at that time, I thought fructose has got a you know, low glycemic index. So anyway, that was what the stuff was made out of. And uh, that was the, you know, the book Thin So Fast, which the publisher had badly, badly miscalculated because they didn't understand, I guess, how the publicity cycle runs. And after Oprah had come out and done her thing, every news show had had a program on fasting, on this protein sparing fast. And so when we came along, even though it was only a month later, we couldn't get on any shows. I mean, not any shows anywhere. And so they sent me on this grueling book tour to all these places where I was on, you know, little local TV stuff that doesn't do anything. To make a book a bestseller, you've got to get it on a national show. But anyway, the book quietly slipped beneath the waves, and so Vitaly didn't have a lot to worry about. But what was... Uh, what was interesting about, oh, th and this is how these shakes work. Now, this is a wall of, of protein powders that I took just before I left to come here to show you what it's like today. And that's not even all of it. That's what I could get as far back as I could get to take it. I mean, there's a whole wall of protein powders. And back then, there were just a handful. And the way that these shakes were made back then, too, is amazing when I think about it today in terms of, of what we've got available. Because what they did is you started out with a... Uh, with diet drinks, that was the base, okay? So you took a diet drink, you took your protein supplement, whether it was Medifast or the stuff from ThinSoFast that we taught people to make, you mixed it with some ice, you threw it in a blender, you whirred it up, and you got a shake. And if you used Dr. Pepper or Coke or something, it was chocolate looking, and if you used Sprite or 7-Up, or, or, uh, it was vanilla looking, and, and it was the, the the soda that gave it its taste. I mean, it sounds awful. It, but they, they actually weren't all that bad at the time. But that's the way these whole thing, and that's the way OptiFast and Medifast work too. They did it this, this same way. So anyway, the, the book slipped beneath the waves. Vitaly didn't have anything to worry about. And again, when I was putting this talk together, I wanted to see if he was still around and what was going on with Medifast. So I looked it up and I found this article from the, uh, the Baltimore Sun dated back in 1993 about how, by his son, who's the CEO of the company, about how Vitaly himself started this company. And it says that uh, he was annoyed because OptiFast was so restrictive on who they would let do their program, so he went in the kitchen, uh, put some dried milk, some egg white, and vitamins and supplements, and bingo. <laughs> he had made OptiFast and called it Medifast, which was essentially the same thing that I did in my book that um, he decried me about. But anyway... Hundreds of people didn't die because the book didn't sell very well. So that was the end of that. <laughs> but th this whole experience in researching the book uh, had, had really 
made me a confirmed believer in low carb dieting and what it could do for patients. And I've, I've got to take a minute because um, when I was trying to put this book together, uh, because it was a low carb book, even though it was about this fasting, it was a low carb book to the core. And I had shown the manuscript to several professors I knew at the University of Arkansas. I had shown it to some doctor friends of mine. They all thought it was great. Uh, and I could not get a single person during this era of low fat mania to give me so much as a cover blurb saying, you know, Mike Eads is a nice guy, <laughs> let alone uh, talking anything about the virtues of the book. And the only person that did was this guy named Michael Steelman, who was a physician in Oklahoma City, which is a town about 300 miles away from Arkansas, that I had met at American Society of Bariatric Physicians meeting. And I sent him the manuscript, and he barely knew me from Adam, and he agreed to do this. So this is the first time I've ever talked about this book in a public forum, so I'd like to, to publicly, I know he's not here, but thank Michael Steelman for being the only guy. <laughs> and I know, I know Eric Westman knows him, so you can tell him that I did this because I still see him all the time, but he, he did that and I'm really appreciative of it. Although as I've come to discover, cover blurbs don't mean squat on books anyway, but the, the publisher was desperate for one. So anyway, as I say, this really got me into the whole uh, low carb movement. Now, the other reason that, that the book cratered was not just that it didn't get any publicity, but it was because this is what I was competing with. I was competing with muffins. Now, back in this, in this era, back in the mid to late 80s, when this book came out, cholesterol, everybody was cholesterol mad. I mean, everybody for the first time, I mean, four years before, they didn't even know what it was. Now they wanted to know it. And so everyone was nuts about what their cholesterol was. And this guy comes up with a book called The Eight-Week Cholesterol Cure. It was a mega, mega, mega bestseller. I mean, words can't describe what a huge bestseller this book was. And what this guy advocated was that you make brand muffins. And probably the brand muffins that you see today in stores came about because everybody went on this brand muffin thing and uh, got in the habit of eating these things. So anyway, he, he uh, put this, this book together advocating brand muffins for breakfast to lower your cholesterol because the fiber in the brand muffins was going to lower your cholesterol. And I picked up the book and read through it a little bit before I came here. And he also kind of tells you to eat the brand muffins throughout the day. I mean, if you're hungry, it's like the old ads for camels way back when. You're hungry, you don't want to gain weight, smoke a camel. It was, you're hungry, you don't want to gain weight, eat a brand muffin. And so he was filling people full of brand muffins and supposedly getting these, uh, these cholesterol reductions out of it. Now, he also advocated a fat-free, low-fat diet. He talks a little bit about Pritikin in the book and how you've really got to be um, uh, rigorous in your fat restriction if you really are serious about getting your cholesterol down. But then he says, but if you, you know, if you slack off in your fat restriction a little bit, have another muffin. And, but, but the engine that really drove his program was that he put people on sustained release niacin. So the niacin is what did the work on lowering the cholesterol and the rest of it was just letting people do what they wanted to do anyway, which was eat muffins. Uh, but you can't underestimate the, the impact that this book had at the time. And so anyway, that was uh, also what I was up against, uh, the eight week cholesterol cure. Now, at the time that all this was going on, I had joined uh, a couple of different organizations. I joined the American Society of Bariatric Physicians, and that was a group of, guy, of, of, of docs that were basically in the trenches taking care of overweight people. And a lot of them used uh, medications to do it. They used uh, various kinds of diet pills, uh, but they were all on the low-fat bandwagon at that time. And I also joined the North American Association for the Study of Obesity, NASO, which was the academic uh, group that studied obesity. And I still don't know how I got to be a member of that because you had to be put up by somebody. And I can't even remember now who put me up, but I, I don't know what kind of a con job I did on them. But they ended up putting me up for membership on this because you can't just, you know, write your check and join. And I used to love to go to NASO meetings and I used to love to go to the American Society of Bariatric Physicians meetings, but they were completely different and there was almost no cross-pollination. And in fact, one time I was at a NASO meeting and the, uh, 
one of the deans of, of British obesity research, who was elderly then, I mean, God only knows how old he is now, but he, uh, if he's even still alive, but anyway, he had given a talk on, on keeping your patients happy, which was unusual for a NASO meeting because it was more hard science with them. And I went up to talk to him out in the hall, and he was talking to a group of other academicians, and he asked them, have any of you ever been to an American, have you ever heard of the American Society of Bariatric Physicians? And they all, he said, have you ever been to one of their meetings? And they said, no. And he said, well, I went to one a few months ago. And he said, and it was the biggest group of charlatans I've ever seen together <laughs> under one roof. <laughs> so that was kind of the animosity at that time between the academic arm and the, uh, the ASBP. And I never saw anybody from either group at the meetings, and, and I'm probably the only one that went, went to both of them. But anyway, uh, I learned a lot at, uh, at the NASO meetings, and it uh, uh, really further stimulated my interest in low carb and how low carb worked. But one of the things that the people at NASO were wrapped up in, and now the, the debates at the ASBP uh, were a lot, it's not that way anymore, but it used to be about what drug regimens work best for obesity. Because if you're gonna put people on low fat diets, you gotta put them on drugs. <laughs> That's, that's about all there is to it. And, uh, and NASO was all about calories, 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 calories. You know, calories in, calories out, calories count, all calories are the same. I mean, the real mainstream hardcore view. And I knew better because if, if you look at these, I knew that if I put, you know, patients on this, now these are an equivalent amount of calories. It doesn't seem like it because it seems like the steak would have a lot more. But remember, the steak's 73% water. Suck the water out of it and you don't have a lot of stuff left there. But if you look at the steak and the sugar, that's, that's sugar and that's a calorically equivalent, you're going to have a much different outcome in your patient if you give them this than if you give them that. But the people at NASO didn't seem to understand this. So it got me, you know, interested, and I started, uh, you know, pursuing this more in the, in the medical literature. And I came across this paper um, by this guy named Kaplan, whom I actually met at a, at a anyway, never mind. But uh, I, I was intrigued by the, the title of this paper, The Deadly Quartet. Now, I had already been kind of tripped to the whole idea of insulin resistance and that insulin drives the storage of fat. But I really wasn't aware or didn't think about it as driving hypertension, hyperlipidemia, uh, or any of the other parts of the metabolic syndrome that he was sort of, sort of sniffing around the edges of right there. And that was a real eye-opener to me. So I, uh, I took, because I'd always thought insulin makes you fat, and then you get fat and you get hyperlipidemia, you get fat and you get uh, diabetes, you get fat and your blood pressure goes up. I, I didn't think of there being another cause that caused all of those things. So I went back to my basic biochemistry textbook and I traced out every circuit that I could find, every biochemical pathway that I could find where I could find insulin involved. And I did all this and what I noticed was that every place that I saw insulin involved, I also saw glucagon involved, which is counter-regulatory hormone. And so if insulin made something more, glucagon made it less and vice versa. And I noticed that H, HMG coenzyme A reductase, which is the rate limiting enzyme in the cholesterol synthesis pathway, the very enzyme that statins act on, I noticed in my biochemistry textbook that insulin uh, uh, accelerated this enzyme or activated this enzyme and glucagon inhibited it. And I thought, hmm, if that's the case and I could get people's insulin down and their glucagon up, their cholesterols would probably go down. And so by this time, I had pretty much come around to a uh, full-fledged, low-carb, real food kind of guy and with my patients. But a lot of the patients liked the shakes because they were, uh, they were convenient. But I was uh, really in the process of getting into the, the whole food thing. And so I was reluctant, though, with the low fat mania going on and how afraid everybody was of fat. I mean, you'd think back then, and you, you have no idea, that if, if you eat a steak, you're gonna die of a heart attack. I mean, people, I mean, they didn't think it like that, but they thought that anything that encouraged the consumption of red meat was dangerous. And I was uh, really reluctant to put anybody on it. I put people on it that 
whose lipid values were okay. Uh, I would put people on the diet, but I was really reluctant to put anybody that had bad lipid values on it, even though theoretically, from all my tracing out of these diagrams, I knew that it should lower cholesterol. And then I had this great experience. It's kind of like the one that, that Puccini had. Uh, he was holed up in a rental place in Tuscany, um, getting ready to put on a production of La Boheme and he needed a tenor and he was auditioning tenors and this tenor shows up to the house unannounced who's this little short squat guy and uh, and the housekeeper asked Puccini who was not expecting him you know this guy's here he bring him in so the guy comes in he's this little short fat guy who's got a heavy Neapolitan accent and Puccini's you know tall and stately and he's sits down at the piano and starts to play and the guy starts to sing and after he's sung this this piece Puccini says who sent you to me God himself and it turns out it was Enrico Caruso and that was the start of Caruso's career and so he did get the part <laughs> And lava went. But anyway, I had the same kind of experience because when I was in the throes of worrying myself, you know, about this deal, about is it really going to work, I had this group of patients come in, just bang, 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 bang. I mean, all of these people came in in about a two week period. Now, the first one was this uh, uh, young woman. She was in her early 30s. And my wife had seen her. I worked at one clinic, my wife worked at another. My wife saw her at this clinic. And she had these terrible lipid numbers. She had a, a cholesterol of 374. And I don't know what these all are in millimoles per liter, but 374 is high. High, norm, I mean, normal is about 200. Uh, couldn't measure the LDL because her triglycerides were too high. Her HDL was 28. I mean, these were terrible, terrible numbers. But I thought, gosh, this is a good person to try this regimen on because she's young, she's female. She's probably going to drop dead tomorrow. And so we'll see. So I put her on just basically a low-carb diet, uh, a low-carb diet, steak and salad and green vegetables, G gave her my home number, gave her my beeper number. We didn't have cell phones back then. Gave her my beeper number. I said, go on this. If you have any problems, call me anytime, night or day. And she comes back three weeks later, and these are her follow-up labs. I mean, I was stunned. And while she was out uh, uh, going through her three-week period, I had this other guy come in that was actually a guy I knew. And he was about a 55-year-old male who came in for an insurance physical. And, you know, they, they said, go get an insurance physical and we'll pay the doctor. And so he said, hey, you want to do an insurance physical on me? I said, sure, come on in. So I do this insurance physical on him. He's a skinny guy and he's got a little pot belly. And he says, you know, I've developed this pot belly. How can I get rid of it? So I said, oh, well, just, you know, go on this diet. Eat meat and green vegetables and, and uh, salad and it should take care of it. And he goes, okay, great. That sounds good. I like all that stuff. So off he goes. And then he leaves, and his lab work comes back in, and his, his cholesterol is 312. His triglycerides are, are 1515, which is really high. Uh, for whatever reason, they couldn't measure an HDL, and they couldn't get his LDL because uh, LDLs were all calculated back then by the Friedwald equation, and, and you had to have triglycerides under 400 for it to work. So anyway, he, he didn't get an LDL measurement. So I get this lab work, and I go nuts because this guy is heart attack city he's 55 he's a male he's got these horrible lipid numbers so i immediately call the office to tell him wait let's abandon this diet and, and think this thing through and they tell me that he's gone on vacation so i said you're kidding me and then i thought okay well nobody diets while they're on vacation so i said you know <laughs> call me have him call me when he gets back so he gets back from vacation and he calls me what's up and i said hey i need to talk to you about the diet he said, oh it works great I was on vacation and I lost all this. I said, how did you lose weight on vacation? He said, I was at a place in the Caribbean and they had a lot of fish. And so all I did was, you know, ate fish and, and they had the green stuff, vegetables and it was great. And I've lost a few pounds and, and uh, uh, I feel better. I said, well, you need to come in ASAP and let me take a look at you. So he came in and it was 15 days later. I reran his labs and those are what they are. I mean, everything 
normal, his triglycerides are still a little bit high, but still normal labs. I, it, it was stunning. I had a lady that came in, the same thing, you know, put her on this thing, watched her like a hawk. She did great, had this lady come in. She was the mother of a friend of mine. Her cholesterol was 424, triglycerides way up. And this lady had been to a doctor and had, had been put on Mevacor. And so I told her, because I was unfamiliar with Mevacor and unfamiliar with statins at the time, and they had just come out. And I said, and she told me that her cholesterol had been 600 and something when she went on the statin. I said, oh. And so I said, well, look, why don't you, because I'd read that there was a rebound effect when people went off statin. So I said, look, why don't you stay on that? Let's put you on this diet and see what happens. And then when, when you come back, if everything looks good, we'll wean you off of the statin. So she comes back in three weeks, and you can see her lab. And she also had uh, elevated blood sugar that had, that had normalized by then. And she came back, and I said, okay, well, we, uh, this looks great. We need to start talking about uh, weaning you off of stat uh, off the Mevacor. She said, well, I thought you told me to quit the Mevacor. And I said, no. I, did you quit the Mevacor? And she said, yeah, I quit the Mevacor. So anyway, those are the results with, uh, with the Mevacor gone. Uh, but anyway... Uh, this gave me the confidence when I saw these patients to, to keep going with this and to keep, uh, keep refining it. And, and I realized that, that low carb was, was really miraculous. I mean, it was a therapeutic tool that was second to none. You just don't get these results if you try to put people on a low fat diet. And then I, I saw this study that really convinced me that I was on the right track with low carb. This was a study by Robert Wolf, and I actually saw him present this data. The paper came out in 92, but I saw this a little bit before. But he took five uh, young subjects and he put and used them as their own controls with a three week interval in between the two, um, the two studies. But he took five uh, healthy subjects and put them on a 12 hour fast. And then at the end of the 12-hour fast, he put them on a 72-hour, either a fast, or he gave them intralipid. And intralipid's the stuff that's shaded out there. It's this IV fat that you give to people that, uh, that have uh, compromised GI tracts and they can't absorb fat. So you can actually give them fat IV because you've got to have fat. So if you're feeding, you can't just give people glucose. You've, uh, you've got to give them fat too. So anyway, that's what intralipid was. So what he did on this study is he calculated their, their resting metabolic rate. He bumped the intralipid up to where they were getting 5% more calories than what their resting metabolic rate, the ones that were on intralipid. The ones that fasted didn't get anything. I mean, they just got water to drink. So it was a comparison of fasting with, uh, with basically fat. Now, the fat had a little bit of glycerol in it, but not enough to spit at. Uh, so it was basically fasting or fasting with fat. And, what, and, and then, as I say, he waited three weeks and then did it again with the same five subjects. And what he found was that fasting or fasting with the intralipid was essentially the same in terms of their uh, resting metabolic rate. Urinary excretion was about the same. They weren't one, the, the fasting wasn't losing any more protein. Fluent balance was obviously better with the intralipid because they were getting fluid than they did with the, the plain fasting. And when you look at what happened with glucose, this sort of mirrored what happened to my patients when I put them on low-carb diets. Their glucose came down, uh, their, their free fatty acids, which I didn't check, they were uh, about the same. Uh, the triglycerides were up a little bit, probably because they were giving them the, the intralipid and they were picking some of that up. But the ketones were interesting because the acetoacetate and the beta-hydroxybutyrate were about the same starting off on the first 12-hour fast. And then you can see as they became keto and adapted over time that the beta-hydroxybutyrate became the dominant ketone, which it, it does when people keto adapt. And you can see that their insulin dropped like a rock. And what was interesting is even though they were being overfed with the intralipid, they lost a little bit of weight. They lost uh, 1.86 kilograms, and the people that fasted only lost 2.64 kilograms. And this was with a full load of fat, 5% overfeeding them. And so I took a different... Uh, uh, conclusion away from this study than the guys did that did it. What they said was that uh, they said in summary the present study underscores the importance of carbohydrate intake for normal fuel homeostasis. Well what my takeaway lesson from it is is that probably the normal homeostasis is probably a keto adapted diet. And they also said uh, God 
is driving me nuts. You're pushing that. Now I gotta go through all the animation again. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Forget it. Uh, but basically it was something in the, along the same lines as the other. Now, you know, people say, well, you know, you've never tried a low-fat diet. You've never worked with patients on a low-fat diet. You don't know what it's like. Uh, critics that, that I deal with on this. And I say, oh, yes, I do. Because our little clinic was the largest center in the world for the Orlistat maintenance study. Now, anybody in here know what Orlistat is? You know what that is? It's a, it's a lipase inhibitor, and it prevents the absorption of about 30% of fat from the GI tract. And the uh, Hoffman LaRoche made it at the time. It was interesting when they approached us about doing this study, they was, were giving us the history of it, and they said that they first tried it as a cholesterol-lowering medicine because they thought, hey, if we can block fat, people won't have cholesterol. Cholesterol medicines were, were making huge amounts of money, and that was the first thing they thought, but it didn't work at all as a cholesterol-lowering drug, as anybody that puts people on low-fat diets will tell you. So then they said, okay, it's going to be a weight loss diet because it's going to make people go on sort of artificial low-fat diets. And so people that got in the study, you know, we did a physical exam, all this extensive lab work, each AKGs, gallbladder, ultrasound. And the way the study was set up is there was a six-month lead-in period where people had to lose 4% of their body weight on a low-fat diet that was calculated by the dietitian that we had to hire to do this study, they had to lose 4% of their body weight. And if they did that, then they made it onto the, the one-year part of the study where they were randomized into one of three doses of Orlistat or control. So on the, on the first six months, we had all these patients. As I say, we were the biggest center in the world. And we had all these patients, and they went you know, on a low-calorie, low-fat diet, Something has gone wrong, but anyway, the, uh, they went on a low-calorie, low-fat diet uh, that, that uh, didn't work very well, and you cannot, and, and all of these patients were over 200 pounds that came in, and all they had to do to make it in randomization was lose eight pounds in six months, and a huge percentage of them could not do it on this low-fat diet, and they had tons of hands-on care. We had a dietitian, we had counselors, we had all this stuff paid by the drug company to come to our clinic and deal with us, and they couldn't do that. Uh, they were unhappy with their weight loss because they would sit in the waiting room with our regular patients, and they would say, you know, what are you losing? Oh, I'm losing all this weight, and they weren't losing anything. So they were, uh, they kind of got unhappy about that. Uh, they, 12% uh, uh, of them during their time on the low-fat diet developed uh, gallstones by ultrasound and couldn't get randomized and had to go off the study. Once they got on the randomized part of the study, they uh, had to go off, a lot of them did because they were depressed. And they would come in saying, because we told them, you've got to tell us if, if you get any medicine from a doctor. And they came in and a lot of them came in on antidepressants. And they, uh, and the side effects were grim. Uh, they were really bad and they were, <laughs> I can tell you, I can recite it by memory. They were fecal incontinence, oily spotting, and my all-time favorite side effect of any drug, flatus with discharge. And, <laughs> and, it, and it never happened at a good time, apparently, to hear them talk about it. Uh, so anyway, it was, uh, it was kind of a bad deal. Now, so anyway, I've had plenty of experience with low-fat diets, believe me. Uh, because this study went on for two years, and so I was low-fatted up to my eyes for two years. Uh, and it was interesting because it was kind of juxtaposed with our own low-carb uh, patients, and it was interesting to see the difference. Now, this is the bad thing that I did to the whole low-carb movement right here. I had an epiphany, and I don't usually have epiphanies uh, in anything but golf, and I'm working on almost my 4,000th golf epiphany. But in, in turn... <laughs> In terms of anything else, I usually don't have epiphanies, but I had this epiphany about fiber and carbohydrates because I knew that carbohydrates were counted as fiber when they created the labels, the nutritional labels. And so I figured, okay, the fiber is not active like, like the carb is in terms of raising your insulin levels, 
the fiber is pretty inert. I mean, when it gets to the bowel, it does things. And soluble fiber is, so everybody said, great. And so I said, you know, we can subtract the amount of fiber from the amount of carbohydrate and really increase the amount of stuff people can eat. And like, for example, you, you subtract it, and I call this the effective carbohydrate content. And if you look at raspberries, for example, you can, uh, God, I'm afraid every time I push this that it's not going to do anything. Okay, so one cup of raspberry has got 14.7 grams of total carb. Now, that includes the fiber because fiber is measured as a carb. If you... <laughs> driving me nuts. Oh well, you subtract the uh, if you subtract the fiber from it, you know you end up with about uh, uh, eight grams, about eight grams of fiber in there. You end up with about six grams of, of carb that actually causes a problem. So I thought, okay, by doing this, this will drive people to eat more nutrient-dense food. They'll, they'll gravitate to these things because usually these fruits and vegetables have a little bit more fiber in them uh, as, a, as a, a percentage of their total uh, uh, carbs are pretty nutrient-dense and so that it would drive them in that direction. And so we printed on all these little sheets where we did the calculations, uh, wrote about this and thin so fast, and then we actually put tables in uh, protein power, but what it ended up doing overall was that a lot of people that were low-carb entrepreneurs got a hold of it, and they started making sugar alcohols, and they started making low-carb junk foods, so you could get low-carb brownies and low-carb ice cream and low-carb muffins and low-carb this and low-carb that, and, you know, and that was not the intent to begin with, but that's kind of... Uh, uh, my ding on the on the low carb movement. Now, this is a, a book that I read when I was going on this thing. Does this red light mean my time is up? It does. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to rush. Uh, let's see. Let's whiz on through Napoleon's glands because that's a talk for another day. I want to get to the the juicy part of this. Come on. Why is all this showing up when I don't want it to? And I can't get it to show up when I do want to. Uh, anyway, these other books, I got sidetracked in writing Protein Power, which my wife joined me on, not getting sidetracked, but trying to keep me focused. But I got sidetracked with all this anthropological and archaeological evidence that was, uh, was in these other books. And that's the topic of the, the next talk that I give. But uh, anyway, Protein Power had a section on... Uh, all this that everybody found really compelling, uh, like Professor Noakes mentioned, the part about the ancient mummies, uh, the part about the hunter-gatherers versus the agriculturalists, and protein power threatened to be overtaken by this and be a book about nothing but that. Um, and so they really had to rein me in on it. But I ended up getting a chapter in it, and it was right up front. And everybody that talked to me about the book said, hey, I really, that was really great. And then when the paperback came out, had a different editor, and the editor insisted that we get rid of that chapter, and I had to fight tooth and toenail, and it finally got relegated to an epilogue in the back. So anyway, the, uh, now during this whole time when we were doing this, we had to fight what I call the vampire myths of low-carb dieting, which I'm going to whiz through because they're myths. That's exactly what they're, that low-carb diets clog your arteries, they destroy your kidneys, they cause osteoporosis, they decrease endurance only at the start. Uh, once you're keto adapted, they don't. Uh, they make your thinking fuzzy, sometimes a little bit at the start. Uh, that they cause cancer. Hell, are actually using it to treat cancer now. The, uh, uh, they cause dangerous ketoacidosis. They don't. They cause nutritional ketosis. Uh, that they defy the laws of thermodynamics. This is my favorite one. Because the laws of thermodynamics cannot be defied. And I'm not going to go through all this, but there, there's, you know, Talbs and I have argued about this a bunch. He's got this great deal about a restaurant that he doesn't use because he uses other stuff about you know why is a restaurant crowded if you say well because more people are coming in than going out people look at you like you're an idiot but the real question is why are more people coming in than going out and that's kind of what he talked about in his talk the uh, other vampire myth they, that low carb diets are simply calorie restricted diets okay so we got a diet that you can go on that's filling you don't have to watch what you eat you don't have to watch the amounts you eat and you spontaneously restrict calories there's a problem okay <laughs> Low-carb diets don't work any better than low-fat diets. And this is, a, this is an interesting thing that I'm not going to dwell on because if you look at this, this uh, thing again, you, you see that uh, 17 out of 25, so 8 of them, 
did not have the, the weight loss as we talked about before. And this is the reason why, it's how they're looked at. How many of you know what intention to treat analysis is? Anybody know? A few people I know know. Well, ITT, intention to treat analysis, I guess it's okay for some things, but it's, a, uh, uh, it's asking kind of one question to get two different answers. When you put people on an intention to treat analysis, let's say you've got a drug that you want to study and you put 100 people on the drug and you put 100 people on the placebo, you kind of want to find out what the end result is overall from that. And if a bunch of people fall out on the drug arm, you, you want to know that and it'll be reflected in the statistics because maybe they had bad side effects because you're, you're trying to do this to figure out if this drug is a, is a marketable drug. But when you do it with dietary studies, it's terrible because here's, here's what happens. Let's look at two diets. You've got diet A and diet B. You got, because intention to treat analysis means that everybody that goes on the study gets counted as having completed the study whether they did or not. All right? And here you look at diet A and diet B, subject starting study 50 in each one, let's say subjects completing 20 in diet A and, and all 50 completed diet B. The total weight loss of the people that completed the study is 60 pounds in each case. And uh, that's actually 60 pounds per week. So if you, if you look at the average weight loss for your completers, you got three pounds per week in diet A, and you got 1.2 pounds per week in diet B. So a big difference. But if you look at it overall, if you take the people that dropped out of the diet A arm of the study and look at them, everybody lost 1.2 pounds a week. So they say, hey, these two diets are equal by intention to treat analysis. And that's not true. What it tells you is that diet A is a little tougher to stick on, but if you stick on it, you're gonna do a lot better. And that's the information you should be getting on this. People should say, look, I've got two diets for you. I got diet A that's tough to follow, but if you can hang in there, you're gonna lose weight like crazy. I got diet B, eh, you go on that, it's kind of easy. You'll lose a little bit of weight, but that's it. But that's intention to treat analysis. And all these studies, they've used intention to treat analyses on them. And I'm just gonna whip through these things because it's, uh, I was gonna give you an example of one. Kind of, The, the take home message on this is that intention to treat analyses, it's always the better therapy that shows up the worst in that. So that's why these low carb diets didn't reach statistical significance because the people that dropped out of them, there was such a huge difference in the weight that the people that stayed in and the people that dropped out that it skewed the statistics. But you can't even get a study funded unless you do intention to treat analysis. So it's tough to do. Okay. so. And I wanted to make the case that low-carb diets do do this. Now, this, I think, is kind of important because it addresses what we've been talking about in this conference today. Back in 1973, a couple of urban planners from Berkeley wrote this seminal paper called The Lemmas in a General Theory of Planning. And I found out about this from Jonathan Haidt, a psychologist that I like. And Anyway, in this dilemmas in a general theory of planning, they were wondering why some problems were different than others. And they called these two problems, these two sort of types of problems, wicked problems and tame problems. Now, a tame problem is something like this. Tame problem, the guy in, in uh, Australia, uh, what's his name, Barry Marshall, the guy that was trying to convince people that that uh, Helicobacter pylori caused ulcer disease, couldn't get anybody to pay attention to him, so he mixed a bunch up of it, uh, mixed a bunch of it up in a glass, swilled it down, got ulcers, uh, kind of proved his point. Now everybody believes that, and he got a Nobel Prize for it. That's a tame problem. Uh, you know, data-driven problems are tame problems. What are wicked problems? Wicked problems are problems like immigration, fair taxation, poverty, unemployment, human rights, gun control. These, these things are emotionally charged problems. And they're not easy to solve with data. And even if you muster data, the other side's not gonna believe it. So it's really difficult to solve wicked problems with data. It just can't be done because there's a narrative that goes along with it. And unless you can change the story and change the narrative, you're not gonna change the way people think. Because as any good social psychologist will tell you, data, it sounds strange, but data does not change people's minds. Stories change people's minds. Okay, now we go back to this. We've got the data. You would think with this data that everybody would be lining up to go on a low-carb diet, but they're not. And the reason they're not is because it's a wicked problem. People come to it emotionally charged. People are fat because they're gluttonous and they're lazy. Uh, people are fat because of big egg. People are fat because of big sugar. 
People are fat because there are too many fast food restaurants. There are a plethora of reasons that, that people have, and it kind of comes down on, on which side of the political spectrum you're on of, of what you think the problem is. And just like it's been said, and I think with a certain amount of truth, that, that people on the right side of the political spectrum think people on the left are misguided. People on the left side of the political spectrum think people on the right are evil. And I think it's the same thing with with this uh, this obesity thing with the low-carb diet. I think people that are believers in the low-carb diet because they've seen it work think that people on the other side are misguided. I think that people that don't follow low-carb diets and are kind of believers in the low-fat diet think that low-carbers are, for lack of a better word, evil. I mean, I think they're moralistic issues. They think, you know, you're pillaging the earth, you're killing animals, uh, you're doing all these things. So, so even though it's data-driven, it ought to be a tame problem. It's a wicked problem, and wicked problems can only be solved by changing the narrative. And that's where it really kind of gets interesting because we all have a confirmation bias. And this is a little quiz that our own CIA gives their agents about confirmation bias. Now, you see these little things. We've all seen these little homilies. We'll take a look at this. You see that? I'm sure most of you didn't because I certainly didn't see it. And that's, uh, you think you know what you're seeing, and that's why they gave it to CIA agents. Now, we've got to change the, 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 um, the narrative on the low-carb diet if we want to get any traction. We can't just keep cranking out studies. That's great. But if we really want to do something, I think we need to change the narrative. And if you look at Google Trends on a low-carb diet, it's, you know, ah, back, back, back. Dull as dishwater. I mean, we had a little peak. This is Gary Taub's article in the New York Times. Now, when he did that, we had a peak that came up and a peak that came down. Now, I'm in a startup company right now, and that's what's occupying all my time. And so I'm studying all this business stuff. And the one thing you learn is that businesses that go up fast come down fast. Businesses that grow slow and develop an infrastructure last. And so we've got, so that went up fast when he wrote that article, and it came down fast. And it's been pretty much level ever since. And that's the low-carb diet, because there's no narrative on a low-carb diet other than look at, we got another new study showing how good the low-carb diet is. Now let's look at a diet that's got a narrative. Here's the paleo diet. Now there's a narrative. People can understand that. It's a story. Okay? This is the diet our ancient ancestors cut their teeth on. And I looked at the paleo diet as, as sort of an argument for the low-carb diet because the paleo diet was obviously a low-carb diet. Now, the people in the paleo diet, there's all kinds of infighting now over who's more paleo than, than whoever else. And are potatoes really paleo because they're a tuber? And, you know, you've got all this going on. But nonetheless, it's a narrative, and you can see this. And in case anybody wants to accuse me of, of using two different scales on these, if you look at that, there's the low-carb diet. Old dull as dishwater, just plugging along at the bottom. And you can see the narrative of, of the paleo diet. So we, as, as low-carb people, have got to come up with a narrative. And I think that's essential in whether we hang our, our you know, hitch our wagon to the, to the paleo star or we do something. We've got to come up with something because people are not convinced by data. That ought to be pretty clear by now. So that's what we've got to do. And as, a, uh, as I read the other day, I was reading the review of a book, and, I, and the guy that wrote the review perfectly summed up the situation I think that we're in right now with low carb. He said, he was talking about this, this book that he was reviewing that he didn't like and it had a lot of problems with it. And he said that a, an instructor of his had, in college had told him that every lion has fleas. So every great hypothesis is going to have little, it's going to have fleas. So don't worry about the fleas. The bigger question is, is there really a lion underneath those fleas? And in the low-carb diet, there is absolutely a big, monster-ripping, snorting lion. And we've just got to figure out a way to make people aware of this. And I think we've got to do it by changing the narrative. So anyway, I, I thank you all very much for your attention. <laughs>